I would like to introduce uh, now my colleague, uh, Ron Granieri, who is uh, the Director of Research at the Lauder Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also lectures. He is uh, a Senior Fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, Executive Director of our Center for the Study of America and the West, and the popular host of our monthly interview program called Geopolitics with Granieri. Uh, you could tune into it uh, one Tuesday a month uh, live on the web, or you could listen to the archived versions of it on the web as well. And he is also the editor of a new electronic publication of ours called The American Review of Books, Blogs, and Bull. Uh, please welcome Ron Granieri. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody, for your attention uh, and, and for your good humor. Uh, being the last speaker is a, a challenge. Of course, you know, trying to wrap up the First World War is a challenge anyway. I, uh, I was trying to reach for uh, historical analogies, right? Analogies are never perfect, as Professor McDougall said, but historical analogy for being the last speaker. Of course, everybody's, every speaker's favorite analogy for being the last speaker is you, you want to be the person at that moment when Edward Everett sits down and the master of ceremonies and says, and now, President Lincoln, would you like to say a few words? Um, but that's a, that is a flattering and ultimately dishonest analogy, right? Because none of us is Abraham Lincoln. Actually, the analogy that I was thinking of while I was sitting this morning listening first to Professor Maurer and then to my, uh, my, uh, my hero, Professor McDougall, I, uh, I was thinking of Fred Capps. Does anybody know who Fred Capps is? You probably don't. Nobody would. Fred Capps was the, uh, was the act that followed the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show in February of 1964. Um, Ed Sullivan, they, after the Beatles played their first two songs, they went to commercial, then they came back, and Ed Sullivan had to spend extra time getting the crowd to calm down before he said, and now a young man we're very proud to have signed last summer, Fred Capps. Give him a nice warm welcome. Um, yeah, so uh, but I I hope that I hope that when the conference is over that you'll remember me a little more fondly. Apparently Fred Capps was a very good comedian and magician in 1964. I bet you didn't know that, but now that you do. So at least you take away that one piece of information. Who spoke after McDougal? Fred Capps? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Now that, now that I've got your attention, uh, but I want to talk about the war and the end of the war, and I, I want to do a couple of things. I mean, one of the advantages of being the last speaker was I got to hear what everybody else had to say, so I was able to drop things from my talk that I knew had already been said. Um, some things you'll hear might be a little familiar as well, but also I come at this from a slightly different perspective. My training is in European history and European international relations, and so I want to talk about the, the meaning of the war and the problem of post-war peace um, related to this, this larger question that came up at the very end of the Q&A there with Professor McDougall, which is the, uh, the question about um, how, how, if at all, do you have a peace without victors? Um, but if you don't have a peace, you can, I would say that you can have a peace without, you can have a peace with victors, but still a negotiated peace. And I believe that one of the, one of the puzzles that we have to figure out with the end of the First World War is why did we get to this point where um, you had Wilson offering a peace without victors and the Allies offering a peace conference without the defeated? Um, and how do we get to there and, and what, was the, what was the problem? the problem for post-war uh, post peace. And so, um, since it's Sunday morning, we should always start with the text. Um, and so, uh, a text to put us in the mood to think about what the First World War meant. As you know, the First World War produced an awful lot of great literature, especially a lot of great English poetry. One of the great famous English poets was Wilfred Owen, but one of his less famous poems I find whenever I present this to a group is The Parable of the Old Man and the Young, and I'm not going to resist the temptation to give you a dramatic reading. John Maurer is stronger in character than I am as far as that goes. But it's a, um, but the poem is very powerful because of what it says about the war, right? So Abram rose and clave the wood and went and took the fire with him and a knife. And as they sojourned both of them together, Isaac the firstborn spake and said, my father, behold the preparations, fire and iron, but where the lamb for this burnt offering? <laughs> <laughs> 
Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps and builded parapets and trenches there and stretched forth the knife to slay his son when, lo, an angel called him out of heaven, saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, offer the ram of pride instead of him. But the old man would not so, but slew his son and half the seed of Europe, one by one. We think about you know, one, of the, one of the iconic stories in, uh, if we think about civil religion, if we think about the religious background of Western civilization, the story of, of Abram's sacrifice, right? That the Lord tests Abram by saying, I want your firstborn son. And Abram shows that he is loyal to the Lord because he's willing to do it, but the Lord shows he is loyal to Abram by not demanding that he do it. Now, Owen takes this story, right, and puts it in the context, and Wilfred Owen, as we all know, who died on November 4th, 1918, in battle. Uh, he takes this and emphasizes the generational crime that the First World War was. And you see the, the language of the poem, of course, takes the biblical story but adds in lots of, of t terminology, right? That he, he binds the youth with belts and straps. All, uh, I, you've seen plenty of pictures of men wearing Sam Brown belts. You know what they're talking about. Um, the fire and iron, the parapets and trenches, right? That this is the blood sacrifice of Western civilization. And the question is, why? does a civilization decide to fight a war that is so destructive and then once started, why are they not able to stop it? This is the puzzle for the First World War. It's the problem I want to talk about here today. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Europe. We're going to talk a little bit about the U.S. and about Wilson and about what comes after. I'm going to try to be, uh, as befitting the last speaker of the conference, I'm going to try to be uh, as energetic as I can be without falling off of my platform. I'm going to try to be um, brief and I'm going to try to be provocative so we'll have time for questions. Now, one of the most famous phrases, and Jennifer Keene, who is not here right now, uh, unfortunately, but she, uh, she uh, cited this, gave a shout out to everybody's favorite uh, military philosopher, Karl von Clausewitz, who is uh, quoted like crazy, though not necessarily read, but one of his most famous quotations is this one, right? War is not an independent phenomenon, but the continuation of politics by different means, right? Die Fortsetzung der Politik mit anderen Mitteln, as he, as he said in his uh, original text. It always sounds better that way, don't you think? But the, um, there's a problem with this quote from Clausewitz, not in the quote itself, but in the way that it is commonly understood and the way that it is often discussed. The problem with this quote is this quote is often used, not to put too fine a point on it, um, is often used by cheerleaders for military force. Because what they want to do, if I may use a German term, is they want to verharmlose. They want to make uh, the decision to go to war, the decision to, to seek recourse for arms, seem harmless by arguing that it is the natural progression, that it's merely connected to politics, that it shouldn't be something completely different. Now, that's not wrong, right? because that's part of what Clausewitz and Clausewitz's message for today is, that we need to think of war in the context of politics. But this doesn't mean that we have to rush to war which is sometimes implied by people who say, right, we need to continue politics by other means. But the message that does come across that we need to think about today is what Clausewitz imagined was that any resort to arms should have a clear political purpose, right? So that if you disconnect politics from the use of force, you're not doing anybody any favors, right? Because then you're no longer serving a political purpose, which means you're putting your society at risk. But you're also, you're not doing any military purpose either, because what exactly is the purpose of all the destruction? What we need to see when we look at the First World War is how that, the, the connection between politics and force was broken. And it was broken to the point that it was impossible, or it seemed impossible, to stop the war. Which brings me to a minute to, uh, to our friend Woodrow Wilson, right? Is that there, you know, there are a lot of commonplaces about the First World War and the strengths and weaknesses of Wilson's approach to its aftermath. And as we've heard today, there are plenty of places where Wilson got things wrong. 
Um, <clears throat> Michael Nyberg even mentioned yesterday, right, that Wilson was much less of a thought leader than people imagined, suggesting that Wilson was a follower, that he never really did have a large segment of the American population uh, behind him anyway when he talked about a peace without victors and whatnot. But the critics of Wilson, and, I, and as you'll see in a few minutes, right, I tend to be in that group as well, of which there are many, tend to emphasize the uh, irrational idealism of his efforts to remake diplomacy after the war. And they may indeed be right that Wilson placed too much faith in the power of free trade and Republican governments as identified in his 14 points. He also certainly played fast and loose with terms such as national self-determination. Uh, because he didn't really think about what they would mean in practice, or he knew that they wouldn't be applied to people, all peoples everywhere. Uh, ask the Italians, the Germans, the Irish, the Hungarians, or the Arabs um, what they thought about Wilson's notion of self-determination. And he definitely failed, Wilson did, in the crucial moment, in that he was neither able to convince his partners at Paris of the overarching logic behind his original vision, or to convince his colleagues and voters back home after Paris that the compromises that he made there, which resulted from his negotiations with Britain and France, Britain and France, were worthwhile. Perhaps worst of all, Wilson clung to the notion that the League of Nations alone, that getting that through, would solve all outstanding problems once it was up and running. One of the reasons why Wilson didn't want to make any more changes once he had a treaty was he just, he pushed off questions to say, the League will solve these things. He had faith in that structure. This combination of stubbornness and forced optimism would prove dangerous, as his unwillingness to admit the imperfections of the Treaty of Versailles contributed to its failure in the Senate. But Wilson's sudden literal collapse in September 1919 and the slow motion figurative collapse of the League of Nations in the two decades that followed offer eloquent testimony to the faultiness, even the impossibility of Wilson's vision for world affairs. But just because Wilson's prescriptions were faulty or badly applied doesn't mean his diagnosis was incorrect. For the old diplomacy, whatever you want to call it, balance of power is not quite accurate. Uh, but let's just say the traditional power politics, a power politics that believed in the connection between war and politics had fallen apart, and it had failed in the years between 1914 and 1919. Now, it hadn't failed because the war broke out. That's actually a perfectly natural and normal development. We'll come back to that in a second. That, that war broke out is not the collapse of the international system. No, the prop, there, there had been wars or near wars virtually annually since 1904 in Europe. The problem was not that the system had allowed the war to start, but rather that it proved utterly incapable of limiting the scope of the war, let alone ending it, once it was clear that the war was serving no larger strategic purpose. Now, I said I would be provocative. So that's my first provocation, right? The, the, the mere outbreak of war is not a sign of a failed international system. And indeed, I say that contrary to another very powerful commonplace about the outbreak of war. People often talk about the outbreak of war in 1914, and they say that when, when the, the, the great powers of Europe went to war in the summer of 1914, this was the first time in 99 years that there had been a general war in Europe. Right? They say this as though the war marked the end of a century of peace. But this is only true if one engages in some pretty significant verbal gymnastics, right? It's certainly true that there was no general war that involved all the powers of Europe um, in multiple geographical theaters between the end of the Congress of Vienna and August of 1914. That's true. But that's not the same as saying that this was a century of peace, because of course there were wars. Limited in geographic scope, perhaps, some of them even vaguely ridiculous in the relationship between their purpose and the violence that they wreaked, but real enough to the soldiers who gave their last full measure of devotion at Solferino or Sebastopol, Sadova or Sedan. There were multiple wars, threats of wars, emergencies, and crises in the century between 1815 and 1914. What marked the years between Vienna and Sarajevo was not peace, but rather the more or less continuous management of conflict. <clears throat> 
This was the hallmark of an international system in which force and diplomacy existed in a tight relationship with each other. And I'm not, I'm not claiming that the statesmen of the 19th century were particularly brilliant here. We could talk a lot about specific cases. But it is true that the system found a way in the way that the states operated within it. Um, so that diplomacy did not banish force. Rather, diplomacy and force tempered and restrained each other, placing limits and encouraging the resolution of conflicts sooner or later. The goal of the international system in the 19th century was not permanent peace, but the ability to contain and correct outbreaks of violence and to find settlements for those conflicts that eventually did emerge. So I'm not, I'm not trying to romanticize the pre-1914 world, but I am saying that the difference between the July crisis and the crises that led to limited wars in Crimea, Italy, Denmark, Austria, France, South Africa, Korea, Siberia, and the Balkans, not to mention the near wars in places such as Fashoda, Morocco, Bosnia, and China. Did I mention this was not a separate century of peace? What, what separates those is how even when disputes between great powers spilled over into violent conflict, the conflicts were kept within geographic and strategic bounds. And the settlements that arose, while not peace, they were certainly not pieces without victors, they were the product of diplomatic compromises between the belligerents. The end of the Franco-Prussian War, in this sense, right, which led to the Germans seizing Alsace-Lorraine from France, is actually rather unusual in this period, in the sense that the same Germans, the same Prussians, let's say, in their war with Austria in 1866, had consciously chosen not to make any ter territorial claims on Austria. Bismarck's approach then was that, uh, that the political settlement getting Austria to agree to Prussian dominance in northern Germany was more important. Indeed, there is a lot of evidence that in 1870 and 71 that Bismarck was reluctant to claim Alsace and Lorraine. But we'll come back to that in a minute. So we've already heard this weekend that the war began with a confused combination of, of excitement, trepidation, uh, confusion. Many welcomed it, but before long, the terrible calculus of destruction showed that this war would be something new in the annals of human depravity. But it didn't happen just all at once. I, I have a couple of, couple of images just to get us going here, right? Just a reminder of Europe in 1914. Um, we'll come back to maps in a second. But uh, the happy couple on June 28th, right, where it all started, right, when we talk about the disconnection between means and ends, right, that's Franz Ferdinand and uh, the Grand Duchess Sophie Chotek, uh, Duchess Sophie Chotek in Sarajevo on the 28th of June. But I want to talk about some of the players here, right, to remember that at the, start, at the outbreak of the war, right, the domination of monarchies, right, we've got uh, Wilhelm II of Germany, uh, our good friend Franz Josef of Austria-Hungary, and then, you know, one of the great, you know, prisoner of Zenda moments in, uh, in world history, right? That's the King George of England and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, side by side with each other, wearing each other's national uniforms, right? So that's, so just to make it more complicated, right? You know, they look alike, they sound alike, at times they even talk alike. What a crazy pair. But they're cousins. Identical cousins. Yes, yeah, so that's George, George and Nicholas, right? It's a very uh, interesting image. But we also have democratic, poli or not democratic, civ civilian politicians that are worth, worth mentioning who were, were responsible for managing this conflict, right? So that's Theobald von bettmann holweg German Chancellor, Ramon Poincaré, French Prime Minister, and uh, Edward Gray, French, uh, British Foreign Minister. I mention this because when the war breaks out, Europe is a hybrid society, right? That there is still, still uh, heavy dominance in some, in some geographical areas, but also even in, even in certain social and political areas of, of different countries, still a dominance of the old, old elites, old leadership. Um, even if there were then civilian politicians and experts who were responsible for managing international politics. And the, the, the outbreak of the conflict is such and is so uh, uh, fascinating because of the way that this system basically shows its seams and breaks down, right? The role of military professionals in establishing timetables for mobilization puts pressure on the diplomats and, uh, and, and I should say even puts pressure on the, the aristocracy, 
Um, and the, the example I want to give of this is not, is not uh, uh, Nikki and, and Bertie, but rather Willie and Nikki, right? Because Tsar Nicholas and Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, they were cousins. They corresponded with each other regularly, um, and they, they produced a series of quite astonishing telegrams during the July uh, crisis of 1914, written to each other in English, which is also uh, fascinating. But um, I, I'm not going to read these aloud, but I, but I encourage you, if you while, while I talk for a minute, to, to get a look at them. Is this, is, this is the crucial moment in the July crisis, when Germany has given its blank check to Austria-Hungary about after the assassination, after the Austrians have issued their ultimatum to Serbia. So the Russians know that their client, Serbia, is being threatened with war by Austria-Hungary. They know that Austria-Hungary would only make this threat if they had the Germans behind them. The Russian military is trying to decide how to respond. And Wilhelm and Nicholas communicate with each other as if they have more power than they do. This is what I find very interesting. Is Wilhelm writes, you know, you need to tell your army that Austria is... Austria is looking for a way to resolve this crisis. I am acting as a mediator. You trust me. Um, but, then, uh, but then the Tsar responds. He's, he doesn't understand why the ambassador sounded more belligerent than Wilhelm did. And Wilhelm responds, well, the ambassador is not any more belligerent than I am. I'm doing the same thing. But it's your army, your mobilization that's a problem. What we see here is, you know, a, a, what I say the seams are showing in the international system is we have a, a crisis has broken out where there is still some feeling among the, the related monarchs that they should be able to talk these things out among themselves. Whereas the professional military is beginning to j sort of uh, gear up these very powerful uh, and very difficult to stop military machines. Uh, and the, uh, the diplomats are finding it also very difficult to maintain peace and stability, right? Willie and Nikki, right, this is a, it, it's become a, uh, a, a, a small cameo of a world that's going, that's, that's going away, right? That power is slipping out of the hands of the aristocracy or of the, of the traditional monarchies, even though they are still there in 1914. And the war that will come will severely undermine their societies. And of course, that's where we get to this idea of the, the gradual separation of, of, of war and politics, right? Because Wilhelm II did not go to war in 1914 hoping to destroy the German Empire, right? And Nicholas did not call for mobilization in 1914 thinking that it would lead to revolution. Um, and their misjudgment of that situation, you know, helps to create, you know, the, the, the tragedy that the war becomes. And, of course, that's why we always have... Everybody likes to talk about the great quote from Edward Gray, as the German, um, as the British, uh, I should say, as the British ultimatum to Germany expires, and it's very clear that war is going to come in early August, right? The lamps are going out all over Europe. We should all not see them lit again in our lifetime. So the war starts. And in many of the, many of the stories that are told, and in many of the, even in the way that we talk about this uh, when we teach students, right, once the war starts, we sort of say, and then there was a war. Right? And the war then went on for four years, and man, did it get awful. Right? We talk about the trenches. We think about the way that you often teach this. Right? You know, we get that Edward Gray quote, and then we, have a, then we have a presentation on trench warfare, and we talk about submarines, and we talk about this, we talk about all that. But there had been wars before in Europe, before 1914, right? in, in that century. And what had happened generally when those wars had started is that while the war was going on, there was still talking in the background. And indeed, one of the reasons why this is, the, this is also one of these interesting ironies to unpack. One of the reasons why so many military professionals felt that it was worthwhile risking war in 1914 was because they all kind of believed that there would be a mobilization, a massive clash of arms, one big battle, and a resolution. And this is often presented, once again, the way that we talk about this with students, this is often presented as how could they possibly have been so stupid, because look what happens. Well, the reason why they could have possibly been so stupid is because in 1870, there was one big battle, right? There were a bunch of smaller battles, but then there was one big battle at Sedan, and then the rest was negotiation, right? In 1866, there had been one big battle at Sadova, and then there had been negotiation. Um, there were plenty of examples of battles that had been fought and resolved. And yet, 
what we need to ask ourselves is why didn't Europe find a way, why didn't the European system find a way to, um, to resolve the war once it had begun? And the story of the, the courting of the neutrals, the story of the efforts at mediation is an underappreciated part of the story of the First World War. And this helps us to get at, to put Woodrow Wilson in context, but also to think about, you know, the, the, the fascinating thing about, about talking about big clumps of history is we often tend to forget, like we know the First World War runs roughly from 1914 to 1918, right? That's on the Common Core timeline. What we often forget, even as teachers, and, what our, and, 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 off, and especially what our students don't forget or don't think about, is four years is a long time, right? And people don't live their lives in four-year clumps, right? People live their lives minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. And so the war was a reality for millions of people, hour to hour, day to day, week to week, for four years. And that also meant it was that kind of a reality, not just for the soldiers at the front, but for the civilians back home, and for the people who were technically, <laughs> theoretically, uh, tasked with the responsibility to manage the war and maybe find a way to bring it to an end. And yet they don't. It's not that nobody tries. It's not that nobody tries. Right? You know, that this is why at the, the Q&A with Professor McDougall, what I thought was really great was you know, somebody asked about, you know, where, where, where's a piece without Victor's, what does it look like? And, and Professor McDougall brought up Harvey Zickerman's famous, uh, or, or very, very wise comment that you know, it, it, around Christmas time, 1914, one could have imagined a settlement to the war. Maybe. After that, it got harder and harder. Efforts were made. The Pope, Benedict XV, actually would make multiple efforts to encourage mediation. You'd think that would be his, his job, and he did try to do that. For his trouble, right, the, this, this merely reinforced in Germany uh, deep suspicion of the Catholic Church as a, an enemy of the Reich. For the French, because Benedict was talking about negotiations that should begin without heavy preconditions, the French accused Benedict of being secretly the German Pope. It's actually one of the things that the Vatican would do after the war was over to help mend fences with France is finally agree to the formal canonization of Joan of Arc. And as you, as you may or may not know, Joan of Arc is not canonized by the Catholic Church until 1920, even though she had been, of course, revered by, French, by, by, by the French and by French popular opinion as a saint uh, for centuries. But this idea the the Pope tries, Woodrow Wilson tries, right? The other pope, he tries too, right? He tries with his with his friend. <laughs> couldn't resist with his friend, Colonel House, right? He sends Colonel House uh, around all the capitals to get a sense of what everybody wants. Um, they he even House even drafts a common memorandum with with Edward Gray about the possibilities for a negotiated settlement. But of course, while House is able to travel to all these places because he is a representative of a neutral power. Um, and he's able to collect information, right? He's never able to convene a real peace conference. Um, the problems of the Lusitania, uh, you know, this, the, all these things uh, get in the way as well. But as late as 1916, right, there are substantial efforts at uh, trying to reach some kind of negotiated settlement, that even President Wilson will make an effort um, even to the point why, in late, by late 1916, the Germans approach Wilson, and they suggest there's a possibility of, of evacuating certain parts of France and Belgium. They're very vague on this. Wilson seizes on this as an opportunity to play the peacemaker that he's always wanted to play, um, but he, he gets a lot of pushback from the British and the French. And this leads to an interesting dance within the United States government. Because this, this is one moment where Wilson actually criticizes in discussions with his own staff, he, uh, with his own cabinet, he criticizes the British and the French for their unwillingness to negotiate and suggests that he might even be willing to go public with those criticisms. This then leads Secretary of State Robert Lansing, and well, Colonel House is not happy about this, but Secretary of State Robert Lansing actually goes to the point of committing what Wilson biographer Arthur Link calls in 
dramatic style, quote, one of the most egregious acts of treachery in American history. Secretary of State Lansing publishes a newspaper article on December 21st, 1916, suggesting that the United States was drawing nearer the verge of war because of German intransigence, thereby undermining Wilson's efforts to negotiate with the Allies. Wilson's relationship with Lansing would never quite recover from this, even though they would, well, Lansing would stay in the job for a long time. This helps to, to stall peace conference ideas. But it also was an indication that since nobody could figure out what the basis for peace negotiations would be, you know, what would be preconditions, what would be postconditions, that the, any efforts by neutrals to negotiate were bound to fail. At least that's how it looked then. One of the, there are those who would argue that when Wilson realizes that nobody not, no, I was about to use a double negative, I don't want to do that in case there are any English teachers in the room, but that nobody, uh, no non-belligerent would be able to convene or force negotiations is one of the many reasons why Wilson will eventually embrace the idea of becoming a belligerent. That way you can impose the peace. But there was one effort, one last gasp in the summer of, in, in, in 1917 by one of the belligerents to actually bring the war to an end, and that's from Austria-Hungary, an underappreciated effort, is when, you know, his, his uh, imperial and royal majesty, Franz Josef of Austria-Hungary, had been emperor since 1848, and he dies in 1916. Uh, after 68 years on the throne. A very impressive reign. Um, and by the time he dies, he's outlived both his son and his daughter. Or actually, not his son, his daughter, his son and his wife. Um, and he is succeeded by his great nephew, Charles. Kaiser Karl I, the last, or Karl the last, depending on whom they say, but the, the last Habsburg emperor. Um, and Charles and his foreign minister, Count Atakar Chernin, um, they have realized by late 1916, early 1917, that uh, this war is definitely serving no political purpose for Austria-Hungary. The war that they had, frankly, started hoping to save their empire was now threatening to destroy it anyway. And not just the possibility they would lose, because actually they weren't losing the war at this point, but the possibility that even if, if they, they and their allies won the war, that it would be the end of Austria-Hungary because Austria-Hungary was becoming increasingly dependent on Germany. And so Charles actually uh, works through his brother-in-law, Prince Sixtus of Bourbon-Parma. You know, if you're Habsburg, you have some pretty interesting relatives. Prince Sixtus of Bourbon-Parma engages in secret negotiations with the French, um, and tries to figure out what would be the possible preconditions for a peace conference and a negotiated settlement. This leads to a, uh, some interesting back and forth behind the scenes among the Allies. And in the end, the, what the Allies realize that what Vienna could offer them for peace, in return for peace, was much less valuable than the propaganda benefit of exposing the fact that the Austrians had come to them to talk about peace. And so the French decide to leak news of Prince Sixtus's approach, which seriously damages relationship between Vienna and Berlin um, and makes the peace that much harder to make. And eventually the whole, the whole business falls apart. So we have this idea that, that negotiations, it's not that nobody thought to negotiate an end of the war. What is true, however, is that it was, it was so difficult to imagine uh, what any negotiations would be about or how they would be, how they would resolve the war. And the longer the war went on, the harder it was to imagine. Because the more that different sides were paying for this war and the more time they had spent, and I'm going to come back to this point in a minute, but the more time that all sides in this war had spent telling their people that the, the sacrifices, the increasingly heavy sacrifices that they were having to bear, that those sacrifices were worthwhile because they were fighting for civilization against barbarity, or fighting for the lives of their nation. The more you tell people that, the harder it is then to change your mind. And you say, remember that time I said we were fighting against Satan? I was wrong. <laughs> right? Or, or you know, that's hard enough. Or, could you imagine saying, you know, I was wrong, he's not Satan. Or, you remember that time I said we were fighting against Satan? Well, we still are. But Satan made me a really good deal, and I think we should take it. <laughs> 
right? These are hard to do because this is what we need to remember too is you know, that European history is full of wars, right? Not only this particular period, but even when you look at the period of the 18th century, the 17th century, right? There's constant warfare. Uh, and some of the wars are terrible for the, for the areas that are involved in them, but the wars are able to be managed in part because uh, wars that are fought by and that are, that are run by small groups of people, those groups of people who share uh, a general political outlook, is more likely to lead to making a deal and transferring back pieces of territory. In fact, the fact that Sixtus of Bourbon Parma is related to the Habsburg Emperor is the product of centuries of trading back and forth of territories between the peoples of Eastern Europe, or Central Europe. So, but when you get to the point where you have large industrial states fighting a total war, and even states that are not themselves democratic needing to appeal to the population in order to get them to keep fighting, it's a lot harder to change direction. And this is what leads, and this, there is a connection between the, the, the failure of these efforts at, at mediation plus the, the terrible uh, economic and social consequences of the winter of 1916-1917. This is where we get the revolutions that then break out for real in Russia but threaten every place else, right? The connection between the First World War and revolution is a connection between, uh, is, is because as these societies fight this war, uh, and they, they have to keep making more and more demands on the population and promising that the benefits will come somewhere down the line, eventually those governments uh, will suffer a serious crisis of legitimacy. And so when the Russian Revolution happens, and, and then the failure of the provisional government in Russia to hold off the Bolsheviks is in part because even that provisional government wants to argue that the war should continue, Right? The Bolsheviks win in Russia because they say, no, let's just blow the whole thing up. Right? Peace bred in the land. End the war right now. That's awfully powerful. So when we think about the appeal of the Bolsheviks, that's where it comes from, is the, the collapse of legitimacy on the part of the old politics. And then if we want to understand Wilson and the 14 points, need to be understood in the context of the Bolshevik Revolution. Because right, the Bolsheviks, they come on the scene and they say, none of this is working. We're going to give you something completely brand new. Trotsky announces as Commissar for Foreign Affairs, our foreign policy is to proclaim world revolution. The, the Bolsheviks make sure to open up all the archives and publish as much as they can the secret treaties that had been negotiated by the Tsarist regime. And indeed, they also are able to expose secret deals between the Allies, like the Treaty of London, which had promised the Italians uh, enormous tracts of land in return for coming into the war on the side of democracy. Um, the Bolsheviks were threatening to create an even greater crisis of legitimacy. And so Wilson's speech in January of 1918, where he talks about the, the 14 points, needs to be seen, right, as I have a couple more pictures. You can never get enough Woodrow Wilson, right? We've got the Council of Four at Versailles. Wilson meeting cheering crowds in, uh, in Paris the Hall of Mirrors where they signed the Treaty of Versailles, a couple other pictures. But Wilson's 14-point speech, and I'm not going to read all this to you either, but I, it was very difficult to try to come up with one slide that would, uh, you know, uh, Professor McDougall did a better job than I could, of, of great, um, of, of the, the power of Wilson's rhetoric, power, uh, but also the, the weird obfuscatory nature of Wilson's uh, moralism and politics together. So this last paragraph here is, we have spoken now surely in terms too concrete to admit of any further doubt or question. An evident principle runs through the whole program I've outlined, the principle of justice to all peoples and nationalities. The people of the United States could act upon no other principle, and to the vindication of this principle they are ready to devote their lives, their honor, and everything they possess. The moral climax of this, the culminating and final war for human liberty has come. And they are ready to put their own strength, their own highest purpose, their own integrity and devotion to the test. Right? How, could, how could that fail to move a population? Now, of course, this is after, this is after a speech where he had said, basically, that this is going to be a war for, for free trade and of freedom of the seas and, a, and, a, and, a, and a new Poland and 14 different points, not the 10 that the Lord was satisfied with. But that was the idea, was that the, the specifics of the 14 points were less important than Wilson wanting to be pointing 
towards a new world. And this is not, it's partially a reflection of Wilson's personal theological and, and political views, but it's also, this is a response to the Bolsheviks. Right? They have their new world, here's a better new world. Now, after you read passages like that, you know, as a, as a palate cleanser, you need to read some H.L. Mencken. And Mencken's famous comment about Wilson in his essay, The Archangel Woodrow. I, 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 this is one of, the most, one of the most beautiful takedowns in the English language, right? When Wilson got up on his legs in those days, he seems to have gone into a sort of trance with all the peculiar illusions and delusions that belong to a pedagogue gun mashuga. He heard words giving three cheers. He saw them race across a blackboard like Marxians pursued by the polizai. He felt them rush up and kiss him. The result was a grand series of moral, political, sociological, and theological maxims which now lodges imperishably in the cultural heritage of the American people. Along with Lincoln's government of the people by the people, Perry's we have met the enemy and, he is, and they are ours, and Vanderbilt's the public be damned. The important thing is not that a popular order should have uttered such vaporous and preposterous phrases but that they should have been gravely received for weary years by a whole race of men, some of them intelligent. Here is a matter that deserves the sober inquiry of competent psychologists. I figured if we were going to spend the weekend attacking Woodrow Wilson, we might as well. Uh, we might, in, in this, the culminating polemic of this war against Woodrow Wilson, we have this statement from Mencken. But the point being right, that Wilson... As, as critical as we can all we can all be of Wilson, all that we want, right? That that what Wilson was trying to do, right? That Wilson was not wrong. And this is the old headline here, right? Woodrow Wilson was not wrong, right? The old order had fallen apart, right? That the the the, the great powers had lost the connection between means and ends. They had they had lost all sense of proportion about the the value of this conflict, right? Wilson may be. You know, Wilson may be wrong on other things, but on this he is correct. And so the problem then for European civilization, Western civilization, for the United States as its role in the world power, is what kind of international system should emerge instead? And this is where you know, Wilson's particular, uh, Wilson's particular uh, prescriptions are problematic. Right? You know, is, really, is free trade really the answer? Is, are the particular elements of the 14 points? Can you promise national self-determination without really being able to explain what it is? Right? These are practical questions that need to be lodged against Woodrow Wilson. Um, and, and the way that the treaty fight plays out is, reflects a lot of the, the, of, of the problem. Right? That Wilson proves himself even un incapable of managing the politics of the United States of America, right? the country that he's supposed to be the president of. You talk about a, a disconnection between means and ends, right? It's one thing to claim that you are fighting for all humanity and all of this sort of thing, but it's another thing to not realize that you might have wanted to bring a Republican with you to Paris. Um, and so, it, for whatever reason, right, the failure of the League of... Uh, the, the, the disillusionment that would come because Wilson was not able to make a connection between his rhetoric and the practical results of his policy... Right, this is not just, uh, it, it's, not that, it's not that Wilson is wrong because he was an idealist. I'll put it this way. And it's not that Wilson was wrong because he, was, he, was, uh, he, he over-moralized. I mean, you can criticize those things about him all you want. But what is, what is most important and what gets back to the larger problem of the world in the 19-teens was that this loss of the connection between means and ends. This loss of the connection between uh, why you were fighting, what you were fighting for, and how you were fighting. So in that sense, Wilson is, while Wilson claims to be doing something that's completely new and different, Wilson is actually very much a man of his time. This particular headline from the Harvard Current from October of 1919, I find, I find uh, particularly telling about the, about, because of the two headlines side by side on the same day. Right? This is you know, coming up on, on one of the culminating votes on the League of Nations, right? Treaty opponents see victory in Senate vote. And President Wilson is a very sick man, says Grayson. Right, so that sense that by, by the fall of 1919, right, the dream was already falling apart. Now, this is not to say that there's no peace agreement, right? There is. There's, there's a whole raft of peace agreements to come out of Paris, right? The Treaty of Versailles is not the only one, right? Europe is remade 
after the First World War. Uh, there is even, there's some national self-determination, right? There is, however briefly, a flourishing of Republican governments, right? Germany becomes a republic, right? Uh, uh, Czechoslovakia is a republic, right? Hungary proclaims itself a republic. There is a, there's an, a, a move in that direction, right? And one could see that as progress. But the system that emerges, and this is what I want to what I want to end with, because I'm, I'm just about out of time. So I've, I've been rambling a little bit because there, there are a lot of things I wanted to say, and I hope I said most of them. But the problem is that Europe, the, you know, the war eventually does end. Right? The war ends. Uh, some people celebrate that end of the war. In other places, it sweeps away whole civilizations, whole societies, right? whole governments. They go away. Um, the problem is, is what will Europe get out of this war? What does anybody get out of this war? Once again, the connection between means and ends, right? Who, who wins? One of, the, one of the things you can say through much of the war, right, is the only, the only actor, or it's not even an actor, right? Who won the war? The war won the war, right? Because the war, the war demanded and received, right, a constant flow of tribute from the humans who were unable to escape it, right? The blood of young men and women, the, treasury of, of, uh, the treasuries of civilizations, right? So much brain power, so much wealth, so much life sacrificed on the altar of a conflict that people thought they could control when it started, but they couldn't. What's in the future? Right? One person who lived through the beginning of that war wrote in his memoirs about August 1914, right? to me those hours seemed like a release from the painful feelings of my youth. Even today I am not ashamed to say that overpowered by stormy enthusiasm, I fell down on my knees and thanked heaven from my overflowing heart for granting me the good fortune of being permitted to live at this time. And that young man was in this crowd. And that's him. That's young Adolf Hitler, August 1st, 1914, Odeon's Platz in Munich, in front of the Feldherrnhalle, where the crowd had gathered to listen to a reading of the announcement of German mobilization. Hitler, young Hitler there, would run off and enlist, and the war would be the defining experience of his life. He was a 25-year-old high school dropout and bum. But the war and the changes that it wrought, the destruction that it wrought to the politics, to the society, to the moral fabric of Europe would eventually lead to him coming to power. He won the war. And then the problem, and this is what I want to end with, going back to ends and means. When we try to figure out, right, the war is a terrible thing. The terrible destruction that it, that it wreaks, people do not want to have anything to do with it. Walter McDougall talked at the end of, his, of the Q&A session about how the powerful disillusionment that came with the failure of Wilson's vision leads to this movement towards pacifism, to this belief that since this war was wrong, all war is wrong, there cannot possibly be a good fight. In 1936, the, the, the biggest award-winning editorial cartoon was this one. 1936, Clarence Batchelor's cartoon. It's a young man. On the back of it says, on the back of his uh, shirt, it says, uh, uh, "European youth." The harlot has on her chest. It says, "War," and she says, "I'll treat you right. I used to know your daddy." Right in 1936, right people wanted to blame war. They wanted to blame war, but this was at a time when people who were not afraid of war and who were eager for war were beginning their plans to plunge Europe into an even more destructive war. And so simple rejection of war, while morally satisfying, and it's a very powerful image, simple rejection of war in the 1930s would lead to a great many mistakes. We, when we want to figure out Right. How does Europe go? You know, Marshall Foch famously says at Versailles in 1919, this isn't a peace, this is a, 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 a truce for 20 years. We love those kinds of 
We love those kinds of portentous statements because an era of inevitable tragedy hangs over the end of the First World War because we know that something even worse is going to come after. I mean, if, as if the First World War was not terrible enough, we also have to wrestle with the fact that um, the Europeans would go on and do something even worse after and that the world would go on and do something worse after. And so we want to blame the end of the First World War for what comes afterwards. And I think we need to be careful about that because Versailles didn't cause the Second World War. But the failure of the Paris peacemakers to even match the record of Vienna, which at least managed to go 99 years before there was an all-out general war, it does say, tell us something. The tragedy of interwar diplomacy, however, can be traced back to the decoupling of force and diplomacy, the decoupling of war and the alleged political purpose to which it is put. The inability of the League of Nations to enforce Wilson's vision of collective security in the 1920s and 1930s is a familiar story. But the blame goes beyond typical complaints about idealists and woolly-headed internationalists. The problem was that the powers that should have been responsible for maintaining the peace order this is Britain and France and the United States, uh, but every, everybody who believed in maintaining the peace order as actors in international affairs, they were unwilling to match force with diplomacy when it was necessary to do so, until it was too late. Part of that was because they failed to communicate to their populations the need for doing that, in part because they had oversold their actions in 1919. Why were they, why did the British and the French and the Americans try to pull back from dealing with the international situation in the 1930s? In part because of the growing sense that the post-war settlement was itself not legitimate. And why was it considered illegitimate? Because they felt as though they had overstated its benefits. And because it was not based on, a, on clear responsibilities for balancing, managing force and diplomacy. In the end, by the late 1930s, with no one holding the line, no one willing to act if it was necessary to act, it's not enough to be against war, one needs to be in favor of humanity. If no one is willing to stand up individually or collectively, then anyone willing to destroy the political order found himself pushing against an open door. If we want to maintain peace, we have to realize that human failure is part of the package. Right? This is the tragic vision of foreign affairs. Right? We cannot expect that we can announce that there will never be another conflict. If we're serious about protecting humanity, we have to be willing to see where force is necessary, where negotiations are necessary. Finding that balance, not finding the silver bullet, is what the study of international relations and the making of foreign policy should be about. That, however, is a story for another time and maybe for another History Institute. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ron. We have time for a couple of questions. Walter McDougall. Walter McDougall. We've gone through the entire weekend, and I have waited for this, and it certainly happened. No one, no one has discussed the extremely important debate for the Grand Germany in our history. Yes, thank you. In November of 1918, there are many, many points of view from which you can approach this topic, and if there's anything you can squeeze into a good answer, I'm sure. No, I mean I think this is this is a very good a very good point, and and, and I did uh, I did leave you know, believe it or not I talked for all that time and I still left stuff out, but I did. But this precisely this problem of uh, is it a peace without victors to offer Germany an armistice and then drive a hard bargain? No, it's not. It shouldn't be. And one of the one of the problems rhetorically and politically for the Allies was to figure out how do they come up with terms to get Germany to agree to an armistice that would end the war and then be serious about, uh, about negotiating the final settlement. That's where I see is one of the great 
sort of spaces that gets lost in, the, in our discussion about the end of the war, is that, that um, you can have a peace conference at which it's very clear who won and who lost, and yet still actually have negotiations. That's what happened at Vienna in 1815. That's what happened at Frankfurt between Austria and Prussia in 1866. Why it was impossible to do so in 1919 at Paris um, is, I think, ironic. I mean, I would, uh, since usually when we talk about the, 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 the cause for the war and the cause for its destruction, most people emphasize it's, it's the product of militarism, the product of the old regime and all this stuff, and that's all very true. But it's also, the, the failure of the peace can also be attributed to the dangers of making foreign policy in front of the public. Uh, you know, and I, have, I had a big long quote in the, in the text that I didn't read from George Kennan. One of his big complaints about American foreign policy is the problem with democracies is they often don't want to fight and then once they start fighting they don't know how to stop. He actually compared the United States to a large prehistoric creature in that sense, right? Eventually can't be moved, can't be moved, and then suddenly will stomp everything before it finally comes back to its senses. And so in the end, right, even though the United States and Britain and France had said we're fighting against the German government, not the German people, the German people need to throw off Kaiser Tum, they did, right? Germany was a republic, and yet the Allies could not recognize or, or reward that particular behavior because they promised their people for so long that it didn't matter who the German government was, the Germans were Huns and the Huns need to be destroyed. And so the whole question of stopping, you know, finding a way to stop the fighting and then start the negotiations, uh, that the Allies failed to do that is an extension of this larger disconnect between force and diplomacy because the Allies didn't want to keep fighting either. And they certainly didn't want to have to, even though they threatened Germany with invasion if Germany didn't sign the Treaty of Versailles. It's not like they wanted to do it. Um, but instead of all that posturing and all that rhetoric, some actual negotiations might have gone a lot further. That was a long answer. Any um, questions? Mark Ganaway. Has there been a decoupling of force and diplomacy in the wars on terrorism? Yes, there has in the sense that it's, I'm glad, I'm, I'm of course glad you asked this question as we end up here. I mean, I think that one of the problems today we have in the United States is we have, we have a general decoupling of uh, mi the military and society that's simply in the, in the fact of how few Americans serve in the military. I say this to somebody who hasn't served in the military myself, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging, I'm merely stating a fact. Um, but we have a situation where we have professional military we ha uh, uh, that engages in actions that are, that are ordered by the civilians um, that are not clearly connected to strategy. But there is a sense that certain actions have to be taken for other purposes, to show resolve, to demonstrate firmness, to attempt to be seen to be punishing the enemy. But this, I think, is the bigger problem, too, is part of finding a way to link force and diplomacy, to link politics and war, is to make sure that you are defining the challenges that you face in such a way that allows you to do so. If you talk about your challenges as existential threats, then you make it awfully difficult to talk about the graduated application of force, for example. If you make it sound as though it's an all-or-nothing choice between force and no force, um, you make it difficult to make that decision to use force. Um, and, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to say some of these things to this group is since one of the challenges, one of the things that we want to do with these military history institutes is to figure out a way is how do you talk about the military to our students without simply glorifying particular battles or particular stories of heroism, even though those, are, those have their place. Um, but it's more to realize that a... The, the international system and individual states depend upon uh, the, uh, uh, the authority, they depend upon states and societies finding ways to efficiently uh, and responsibly manage force in the name of security. Right? There, it is not possible. This is the, the, the great failing is anybody who believes that you can sort of hard power is somebody else's job, we're going to be all about soft power, whatever the heck that is, that is a big mistake. You know, individual states might not want to be the policemen of the world, to use a phrase that we can never hear enough of, apparently, in the presidential race. Um, and maybe it's true, right? One state should not be the policeman of the world. 
But that doesn't mean you don't need police. And, and I think that if we, the way that, the way that, the way that uh, societies today tend to frame discussions of security tends to be all or nothing, tends to forget this connection between the need for force in order to preserve stability and security and to preserve peace. Um, and this is why you have people use phrases like Klausowitz and then they're accused of simply wanting to go to war all the time because it's an extension of politics by other means. But as I say, I, I think that we misunderstand Clausewitz if we think that's what it is. I mean, Clausewitz is saying that, the only, that you need to use force in the service of politics, which means you have to be you have to have serious discussions about what purpose this force is going to serve. And I don't know that we have those honest discussions. Thank you very much. Just want to thank Fred Capps. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very poetic uh, presentation, and we thank you, Ron. Uh, one of the, the, the person most responsible for designing uh, today's conference was uh, Mike Noonan, the director of our research and director of our national security program. So I'd like to call upon Mike to make a few closing comments. Well, I want to thank everyone here. Uh, you know, the First World War was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Obviously, it wasn't. Uh, and hopefully, this will not be uh, the Teaching Military History Institute to end all uh, Teaching Military History Institutes. Uh, this is a long, drawn out process to get where we are today. Uh, I think we, uh, not a bad process, but it, it takes a long time. Uh, we start uh, in the summer, basically. Uh, lay on things. So there's a lot of a lot of hands and a lot of eyes that go over this process. So I just want to thank um, Paul Herbert, J.D. Camus, Melissa, the rest of the folks here at uh, Cantini, uh, who are just I can't uh, begin to say uh, enough superlative things about the support and true partnership that we have with them. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rachel Hemmler, uh, who many of you have dealt with, doing some of the logistical details on the FBRI side. Thank Alan Luxenberg, uh, Paul Herbert, Paul Dickler, Walter McDougall, Ron Granieri, and JD, where we kind of uh, think about what's, what's going on. Uh, so it might seem odd that we're doing uh, teaching uh, America's entry into the First World War in 2016, but we really thought that this would be important because you don't want to have this in, in 2017 when everything is happening. We wanted to do it a year out so that there would be materials from this that everybody could use in the classroom. So, so we, we thought that it would be uh, much more valuable uh, to teachers uh, to have this material in advance. And I think that we offered a lot of, of uh, material this week at, weekend to think on. And I think all of the all the speakers I thought were excellent this weekend. Uh, so hopefully you agree. Uh, Paul, did you want to say any last words? Paul Herbert? Oh my God, I'll just echo that. Yeah.